good evening. If you would take your Bibles and open them up to Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. We're going to read Luke 12, 13 through 21. Normally I make the teens sit on the first two rows when I'm up here speaking, but tonight I'll let them pretend they're grown-ups. <laughs> so let's let them scatter out a little bit there. But All right. You're welcome. Luke 12, 13 through 21 encourage you to listen as we read these words. This is from the Bible, God's holy word. And we're going to read verses 13 through 21. I'm not going to comment on any of these verses that we're reading here. Uh, we're going to move to a different point. But I want this to be in your mind, so you have to listen really closely so that you can see the parallels between what we're going to read tonight. Um, so again, Luke 12, 13 through 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I, will, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank we, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the time, Lord, that we have here to pause before you and, Lord, to come before your throne. Lord, we're just humble servants, Lord. We're not worthy but by the blood of Jesus. And we just thank you, Lord, for the time that we have set aside tonight, Lord, to read your word. Pray, Lord, that uh, ears will be open and that hearts will be open and, Lord, that uh, your word will go forth. We know that it will not return void. Pray, Lord, that you'll bless those who are here tonight. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with those who are downstairs working. Pray, Lord, for the young children, Lord, that they'll hear the gospel, and, Lord, that they'll be saved. And just pray, Lord, that you'll bless this short message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would encourage you, again, to listen uh, to this message. Not that it's a great message, um, but when we read God's Word, it's very important. And, and, as, and as you listen, uh, that you would listen as if it was your last message. Um, we're reading here tonight about there is not a guarantee of tomorrow. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. You know, the younger we are, the more invulnerable we think we are, and the more, the more we think that we have a guarantee of tomorrow, but there is no guarantee for tomorrow. And it's very important as we read God's Word that we listen to what He is saying, not that we listen to it as a history book of old history, that we're just kind of pulling up old history and, and hashing out old history and reading stories of the past, but that it is God speaking to us through His Word today. The Bible is a divine book, and He is able to write something to someone years ago and reach right out to you and speak to you personally. Because the Holy Spirit is behind every word of God. Amen. So I want you to listen tonight, uh, this very short message, and I, I don't think I'll get through it because uh, we're going to go to Daniel 5, which is what we just went over in our, in our um, short time with the, uh, with the teens here in our game that we had. Daniel chapter 5, if you'll turn there, we're going to start with Daniel chapter 5. And there's so much to glean from this chapter, I'm sure uh, a series of sermons could be um, preached or, or spoken on on this, on this chapter because it's just there's a wealth of information here, and we'll try to glean just a little bit from it. So if you turn to Jan Daniel chapter 5, we're going to go verses 1 through 4. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, might drink therein. Then they brought the gold vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone." You know, as we read this, 
we see that the, the main figure here is Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, a great king who ruled all of Babylon, one of the greatest and most powerful kingdoms in the whole earth. One of the, the, probably the most powerful kingdom that had ever, ever been to this point. And here we have Belshazzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar's son ruling. And the first thing we hear of Belshazzar in the Bible is where he takes these vessels of gold and silver that were in the house of God, and he brings them to this drunken feast that he has. And we're going to be able to look at this and th think, you know, this is, this is not a wise thing for this man to have done. Amen. This man who is the, who is the son... Of a, we just read, you know, we've, we're going through Daniel. As we've gone through Daniel, we've, we've read about Nebuchadnezzar and how he came to the heights of power. The great, one of the greatest, most powerful kings who, who ever lived. And as the pastor preached last, year, last sermon, uh, he, was, he, he was cut down. God had to, you know, you've got to be careful because when we get pride, God will cut us down. He cut, he cut Nebuchadnezzar down. And Nebuchadnezzar realized that the God, there's one God, and he rules above the heavens. And he is to be praised above all gods. And that he's able to abase and he's able to lift up. He's able to bring us down and he's able to lift us back up. But here we have Belshazzar, his son, who did not obviously learn from what his father had learned. And we see Belshazzar here. And he takes these vessels that were, they were at Jerusalem. They had been taken. His, his father was the one that taken, had taken Jerusalem captive. And he brought these vessels. And they were stored somewhere. But Belshazzar, as he was having this feast... Remembered these vessels for some reason and decided he would make them part of his party, which was a big mistake. And I see, I see as I read this, you know, as he tasted wine, Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. You know, how horrible this, this was that he would think to do this. But I want you to think for a minute. The devil's crowd is always having a party. They, they're always having a party. We look at Babylon, and that's what we're talking about is this kingdom of Babylon. Babylon in the Bible represents the world. It represents the one world system. It represents, it represents Satan's kingdom here on earth. It represents everything that the devil wants is what Babylon embodies. And here we have gold and silver from the house of God. The most sacred place on earth, these gold and silver vessels were used. And the devil wanted to show them off in this drunken party. And I find it very interesting that he takes the vessels of gold and silver and he brings them into this party to just throw a little, just to have a little fun. Because what it was is the devil trying to show off. And he wants to do that with you teens. You see, every child of God is a vessel, is a vessel of God. Yeah. The Bible says, for we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. We have this treasure, treasure in earthen vessel. The Bible says he puts, when we become a Christian, he puts his Holy Spirit in us. We become the child of God. And we are the vessel that God has chosen to put his precious Holy Spirit into. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you become a Christian, you become precious in His sight. The Bible, the Bible says He tries His people as gold is tried in the fire. Because we are precious to Him and He wants us to be finer and finer and finer for Him. Amen. And if we give ourselves to God, He continues to refine us and to make us better and to make us better and more like His Son Jesus who we are following. Amen. But the devil wants to take you, each one of you, not only the young people, he's got his eyes on the young people, he's got his eyes on everyone here in this church. Because what he would, he would love nothing more than to take a vessel of God and take it into his drunken party and fill it with alcohol and fill it with wine and fill it with all kinds of drugs and all kinds of unholy things. He wants to take the holy things of God. These vessels were sanctified. Sanctified means set apart for holy use. The devil wants nothing more than to take something that God has sanctified and put a stamp on and says, I've made this holy, I've made this precious, and I've made this very fine. And he wants nothing more than to take that over to his drunken party and just show it up. And I guarantee if any one of you wants to party with the world, you will be the main attraction. Because the devil wants nothing more than to show you off 
and say, look at that. That was a Christian. That was a Christian. I want to tell you something. Those gold and silver vessels, they had no business being in Babylon. They should not have been there. They had no business being in Babylon. They would not have been there had God's people been following God's word. The only reason they were there is because they departed from the truth and they decided to separate themselves from God. And because of that, God allowed their, their whole country to be invaded, to be defeated, to be captured, and to be taken away. I don't, see, I don't know if you see the parallels. I, titled, I haven't even got to the title of this message, and I don't think we're going to get to it. But the title, I titled this message, Living in Babylon. Living in Babylon. And you'll see, you know, if, you, if we just look at just this, these short little verses, we'll see the parallel of where we're living today in America. And how, because of history, because if we, if we could get through this whole sermon, we would see how, because of forgotten history, because of forgotten history, Belshazzar didn't do what was right. Because of forgotten history, the Israelites didn't do what was right. That's why they were in a place that they shouldn't have been. Had they remembered their history, they would have never fallen away from the God that delivered them so miraculously in the past, and they would have never been taken to Babylon. These gold and silver vessels, young people, did not belong in Babylon. They didn't belong there. But because they were there, the devil was able to use them in this drunken party. They shouldn't have been there. But God still had his hand on those. Even those vessels of gold and silver, they're not as precious as we are. God has sanctified you if you're a Christian. He's set you aside for holy use. He's filled you with his Holy Spirit. He loves you enough to die on the cross for you. All we're talking about here is some gold and silver vessels. And God was jealous over these vessels to the point that he did something miraculous to show that he was not a bit amused at what this man was going to do with the vessels that had been sanctified by God. Amen. If we go to on verses... Um, we're going to go on to verses 5 for a minute here. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote... Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. I'm going to stop right there. You can he was he was he was beside himself. He was and which who who of us would not be scared to death if we see a part of a man's hand come and all of a sudden start writing on that plaster wall while we are doing unholy things with the vessels of God. The candlestick's right there. Doing unholy things, partying, doing all kinds of things. The finger of God came and wrote on that wall. A part of a man's hand. It doesn't say it was God's hand, but it, it, it very well could have been God's hand writing on that wall. We've all been in places we shouldn't be. We've all been somewhere we shouldn't be. As Christians, we've been there. What would have happened had a finger come out of, the, out of the sky and started writing on a wall? Our loins may have been loosed a little bit too, and our knees might be knocking against themselves a little bit. And what's what we deserve? We're, we're fortunate enough, we can read the Bible, and especially you young people, you can learn from the mistakes of older people who can tell you, listen, here's what I've done, and it didn't turn out right. And if you'll listen, you can avoid this path in your road and you can go around it. And by the grace of God, you won't have to go through that. Amen. You can save yourself a lot of heartache. If when you're ready to get married, you marry someone who you want your children to be just like. Think about that. Amen. Who you marry is going to be what your children are like. You want, your, you want your children to dress like the girl that you're wanting to date looks like? The boy that you want to date, do you want your kids to look just like that person? Think about that for a minute, because who you marry is going to be who your children are. If we would just listen to what the Bible tells us, if we would read it like it's written to us, it would change a lot of how we act and what we do. But what we do is we read it like a history book, and we're bored. The reason we're bored is because we're not interested in it. The reason we're bored is because our heart is not in it when we're reading it. But if we would read it like our soul depends on it, like our future depends on it, 
like it's our map to life, like it's our map to eternity, all of a sudden it takes on a whole different meaning and it becomes interesting if we actually care, if we're not too busy living our life. But here we have Belshazzar and his, his knees are knocking one against another. He's a, he doesn't know what to do. He's very upset. Here he has been mocking God. He's been showing off the vessels of God in this drunken party. He's put wine in the vessels of God. He's let his concubines drink out of these vessels. He's let his wives drink out of these vessels. He's let all kinds of people drink out of these vessels. And here the hand, of, the hand comes out and writes on this wall. And what does he do? He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. He has no clue what to do. He hasn't, done, he hasn't made a good decision. Probably his, in hardly his whole life he has not made a good decision. You think, you think you can make decisions that are wrong, not based on the Bible, your whole life? And then when something big comes up, you're going to know where to go? It doesn't work that way. Amen. It doesn't work that way. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't just go from here to there like that. He doesn't know what to do. This hand is written on the wall. He doesn't know what it means. He's having a party and the party's over. My uncle sings a song, Go and Tell the World the Party's Over. I love that song. I love that song. Go and tell the world the party's over. Well, the party's over for Belshazzar. And he doesn't know what to do. He is in, he's in trouble. You know, the world is having their party. They're mocking God. They're drinking. They're doing drugs. They're fornicating. They're, they're, they're doing adultery. They're doing everything that they want to do. And they don't know the party's going to be over someday. And when the party's over, it's too late. Here Belshazzar is, there's a hand writing on the wall, and the party's over, and he doesn't know what to do. So what does he do? Let's read about it. His countenance was changed, his knees are smote one against another. Verse 7, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known the king, to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Isn't that just like the world, though? Something horrible comes up. They don't have the answer. Here we have Belshazzar, and I wrote in my notes, we have Belshazzar, um, if I can find it, afraid, lost, and looking for an answer. He was afraid, he was lost, and he was looking for an answer. And, and this is what happens when, when something bad happens to people who don't follow Jesus. They're afraid, they're lost, and they're looking for an answer. And you would think the first place they would go is to the right place, is to God. But that's not what they do. Sometimes they go to alcohol and look for the answer there. It's not there. Sometimes they go to drugs and look for the answer there. It's not there. Sometimes they go to the doctor. The answer's not there. Sometimes they'll go to the psychiatrist. The answer isn't there. Sometimes they go to a soothsayer, to a fortune teller. The answer's not there. Listen, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. When the handwriting is on the wall and you go to the doctor and say, what does that mean? He isn't going to be able to tell you. Amen. When the handwriting is on the wall and you go to drugs or alcohol and you say, what does this handwriting mean? The handwriting on the wall, it's not going to give you the answer. When the handwriting is on the wall and you go to a fortune teller and say, what does this mean? They're not going to have the answer. They may make something up, but it isn't the answer that you need. When it comes to the point where your knees are knocking against each other and you're so scared for your life, you don't know what, you don't know what the future is. You don't know what's going on. You're afraid, you're lost, and you're looking for an answer. That's not the place to find it. Fortunately, there were was, there was some wise people in Babylon there were some people who knew the history. It'd be nice if we had some people who knew American history. Yes, Wouldn't it be nice if there were some people who knew American history, knew what this country was built upon? Yes. 
We wouldn't be going the road, the road that we're going on right now, where we have men going into women's bathrooms because they're confused about who they are. We wouldn't be going down that road if people knew their history. If people followed the God, one nation under God, if they knew the God of the Bible, we wouldn't be going down the road we're going down. But because they forgot the history, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because, because you forgot me, I'm going to forget your children. That's not an exact quote. That's what the Bible says. Because you forgot me, I'll forget your children. That's a scary thing. God is going to forget our children if we forget him. And here we have him going to all these places looking for the answer, and none of these, none of these people have the answer. But verse 10, Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lord, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in, the, in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. I, I like the tone she has here. Um, remember your father? Remember who he was? Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father. She was kind of chiding him a little bit here. Do you remember who your father was? I mean... Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Why wasn't he still master of these people? His father made Daniel master of all these people, the head of all these people. Well, here we have Belshazzar, his son, and he wasn't honoring what his father had done. Some of that's a friend to your dad is your friend. Yes. Yes. Someone who's an enemy of your father is your enemy. Okay? Somebody, that's, somebody that doesn't like God is not my friend. Now, I want to win him so that he understands who God is and that he can love God the same way I do and be his child. But listen, someone who hates God is not my friend. God deals with a lot of people on how they treat Christians, how they treat you. The Bible says, listen, if, if, if someone comes in and hurts a little child that believes in me, it's better if a millstone were put around his neck and he was thrown into the depths of the ocean than that he would hurt one of these little children that believe in me. God cares about you. And I want to tell you something. If you're at work and you're a Christian and you live a Christian example and somebody mistreats you, you don't have to do anything. You just let it go. Love that person and let it go. Because I guarantee you, God will take care of that situation. And he'll do it a lot better than you can. Daniel, Daniel lived under... You know, Nebuchadnezzar reigned for over 40 years. Had a great kingdom. Here we have Belshazzar, who is in his third year of his reign. His third year of his reign. He hadn't honored what his dad had done. And now, we see that he didn't, he didn't, he didn't honor God's person. He didn't honor God's man. People who don't honor God's man are in trouble. They better apologize quickly. You know, like Job's friends. God, God told Job's friends, you, go better, you better go talk to Job and hope he prays for you because you're in a lot of trouble. Anyway, let's get back to the verse 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and or interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king. You know, then, then. Here's my last chance. I've tried everything else. I've went everywhere else. I've done everything else I can do. I've gone every other place I can go. And now somebody's telling me, Daniel's the answer. I'm going to finally go to Daniel. Then was Daniel brought in before the king. And the king spake and said unto him, Daniel, art thou that Daniel which art of the children of the captivity of Judah? I wonder what's going through his head. Here he is. He knows what vessels he was using. He knows what he was doing when he was partying with the vessels of God. This is the very same night. This isn't a different day. This is the same night that they were partying. They've just seen the handwriting on the wall. They've called everybody. Nobody knows what's going on. And here he calls and he says, Art thou that Daniel? Um, art thou the Daniel of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the father, who the king my father brought out of Jewry? 
I have heard, I, I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, this sounds kind of like what his father went through a little bit. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not shew the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make the interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Isn't that nice? Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, if you can show me the interpretation, Daniel, I've tried everybody else. They can't do it. I promised them some gold, and I promised them a chain around their neck, and I said you can be the third ruler of the because there's another ruler too. You can be the third ruler, and I'll give you all that. I'm going to do that for you. I'm sure Daniel was impressed. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel said, listen, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Amen. You can give me the gold if you want to. You can give me the, the chain of gold and you can make me the third ruler if you want to. But this isn't where I live. This isn't where... Living in Babylon. You live in Babylon. You're from Babylon. You think that because you're wealthy, you're important. I don't live there. If I don't have anything, I am a king already. Amen. I'm not playing king. I am a king. Yes. Amen. The Bible says anyone who's a Christian, you'll be kings and priests in his kingdom. Daniel, Daniel wasn't impressed by this king. He wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't going to in, interpret this because the king was going to give him things. The only reason Daniel was going to interpret this is because there was only one person who could interpret it. And that wasn't him. That was God. And God had given him the interpretation. You see, Daniel knew the man with the hand. And because Daniel knew the man with the hand, he was able to tell what the hand had written. Where all the soothsayers, all the astrologers, all the wise men of Babylon couldn't do it, Daniel said, I don't want your gold. I don't want your silver. I don't want your chain of gold. And I don't want your title. I don't need that. I'm not living here in Babylon. I'm from a different place than you. But I will read the interpretation for you, and I will tell you what it means. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy, king, thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. But before I tell you, I'm going to give you a history lesson, because you need a history lesson to remember where you came from. Because obviously you've forgotten what you should not have forgotten. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew, and whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. And when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Listen to you young people, you know all this. You know the Bible. God will judge you harsher than he judges your parents because you know the Bible. Because you were raised. Some of, some of, some of you people, the others, some of you were raised to know the Bible. He will judge you harder than he judged those who did not know the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know not God's word and God was really patient with Nebuchadnezzar. But because of that, he was harder on his son who should have known. He said, he said, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. You know, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee and thou, and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. 
You see what he's saying? He's saying, listen, here's, what, here's what's going on here. Because, because you have lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. That's what he was doing when he did this. He knew, he knew where these vessels came from. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee and thou, and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. These vessels that were sanctified, they were set apart for holy use. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron, wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. See, he praised everything but God. They were praising everything but God. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. You've glorified everything else. But the very one, those, those fingers that wrote on the wall, that hand holds your very breath. You cannot breathe the very air that you have without God. Sometimes when I pray, I thank God for the breath I breathe, <laughs> for the air that's there to breathe, for my lungs to breathe. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And we're going to finish real quick here because we're out of time. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many, tekel you farson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. It didn't start out, didn't start out serious, did it? Start out with him holding up a glass of wine. And it ended with him being slain. The party's going to be over someday. Amen. The, the, the parable we read at the beginning, the true story that we read at the beginning of this, that man thought he had another day. That man thought he was going to hear another sermon. That man thought he had more time. And the Bible says, Thou fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. Do you see the parallels between these these two, these two stories, or they're true stories in the Word of God. We don't have a promise of tomorrow. The only promise you have is this instant, and that the Holy Spirit is calling all to be saved. Amen. You know, and there's two types of people in Babylon. There's the people that are of Babylon, and the people that are there that don't want to be there. Because they know that's not their home. Belshazzar, his lords, his concubines, his wives, all those people, they were, they were part of Babylon. They were part of the system. They were part of the, the government. They were, part of, they were just joining, hamming it up and having fun. And, and just the party's going to go on. Two years into his third year, the party was still going. But in his third year, one night he held up that glass. And before the night was over, his life was gone. Daniel, he was in Babylon, but he wasn't of Babylon. He'd given his life to someone else. He'd given his thoughts to someone else. He'd given his, 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 his whole being to someone else. His king was God, and when God said do something, he did it. There's only one person that can read the writing on the wall. That's God. That's the only person that can, that can read that and interpret it. He's the one that gave the writing on the wall. And the writing to us may be, if we don't follow God's word, it may be many, many tekel you farce. And if you listen to what that means, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. You know, if, if we don't give our life to God, the writing will be on the wall. And today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time that we have here. We thank you, Lord, for the young people. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here. We just praise you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we're none of us are worthy. We're only, we're only going to heaven through the blood of Jesus. But, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you gave your, yourself, Lord, as a sacrifice for us. And, Lord, that we can live in heaven, Lord, through the blood of Jesus. We just thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. Pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here tonight that's not truly born again, who doesn't know you, Lord, that they would be saved. Lord, we have no promise of tomorrow. Help us, Lord, to give ourselves to you today and follow you the rest of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm the pastor of Gethsemane Church.
you have just watched the message, I would like to take a moment and explain the plan of salvation because there is confusion today about what truly is a Christian. You've probably heard the term born again and maybe you associate that term with a certain group of Christians. Maybe you think it belongs to one group and, uh, because another group doesn't use it. But that term was used by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I want to read a portion of St. John chapter 3. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now Nicodemus was a good man. He was a Pharisee, which we would think of it today as a denomination of the Jewish religion at the time Jesus came. It was the most popular denomination. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling, religious ruling body of the Jewish people. He knew the law well. He was a good man. He was a sincere man. He followed the teaching of the Old Testament. In verse 2 it says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Jesus used this term, born again. He used it again in verse 7. He told Nicodemus, even though you're a ruler of the Jews, even though you're a preacher, even though you're a teacher of the law, you need to be born again. And he explained what the new birth is. He went on to say in verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So Jesus made, made sure to tell Nicodemus that he needed a spiritual birth. Now, we understand to be in this world, we must be born physically. I am here because I was born physically. I have a birth certificate to prove my birth. Now, to be in this world, we have to be born. Jesus said to go to heaven, we must be born Spiritually, we must have a second birth, and that is a spiritual birth. He explained this to this man. So even though Nicodemus was a very religious man, even though he tried his best to live a good life, he was a sinner, and he needed to be saved. He needed to give his life to God. He needed a second birth. He needed to be born spiritually. Now there's two parts to being born again. First of all, there is our part. We must understand that we are sinners. In Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What the Bible is telling us there is that every person who has ever lived is a sinner. I am a sinner. Every person who has ever lived is a sinner. There's only one person who has ever been on this earth who was perfect and did not sin, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are sinners. And then the Bible says the wages of sin is death. If we work at a job for a period of time, we earn our wages. We deserve to be paid. The Bible says what we deserve from our life of sin is death. Death is spoken about two ways in the Bible. It is spoken about physically there is a physical death. It's appointed unto man once to die. So we have this physical death. And then there is the spiritual death. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. People who are not right with God when they die, will die a second death. That's what the Bible tells us. So if God gives us what we deserve, we will die physically and we will die spiritually. That is 
the second death. Now, we must, come, we must come to the Lord to be born again. We must understand that we are lost, that we are sinners, that we cannot save ourselves by any good works. We can work all of our life and not undo the sin that we have done. If we've told one lie, done one wrong thing, we cannot go back and undo that. The only thing that can pay the price for our sin is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must come to Him as lost sinners. And we must understand we are lost. That we cannot go to heaven without this second birth. People misunderstand. They think sometimes that God does not require the second birth. Listen. God sent His only begotten Son into the world to die for us. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if God sent his son to die on the cross and we don't accept him, that is sin. We cannot go to heaven without accepting Jesus Christ. That is the second birth. That is the spiritual birth. So we must come to God understanding that we are lost and we need to be saved. That's the first part of it. We must want to be saved. And only God can draw us through His Holy Spirit. We must be convicted and we must come. But Jesus came and died on the cross to draw all men to Him. So if you've heard the gospel, you are being drawn. Now, the second part is that God must accept us. And I would like to take you over to the book of Romans to the 8th chapter. And I would like to read there just, just a portion of Scripture about the second part of the second birth. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. The second part of the new birth is that God accepts us. We must be willing to accept Him as our Savior and our Lord, and then He must accept us. He must adopt us. And He adopts us by putting His Holy Spirit into our heart. How does He do that? When we come to Him, He looks into our heart to see if we're sincere, if we really want to give our life to Him. Many people come to the Lord and they want to go to heaven, but they don't want to live for Him. Many people come to the Lord and they want forgiveness of their sins, but they don't want to live for Him. When we come to the Lord, God knows if we're sincere, if we're willing to surrender our life and give our life to Him. And if we're willing to do that, he accepts us by putting His Holy Spirit in our heart. And the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. There are a few ways to know that we are saved. First of all, once a person is saved, they will not be ashamed of Jesus. They will be willing to own Jesus Christ as their Savior before men. Secondly, they will have the witness of the Holy Spirit in their life. This God's Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. And third, their life will be changed. The scripture tells us that whenever we become a Christian, that we become a new creature in Christ. And so all things become new. Old things are passed away. So when we become a Christian, our life changes. And we begin to live not the way we used to live, but the way God wants us to live. We go to church uh, because that's what the Lord wants us to do. We, we, be, we become... Christians, we are baptized into the body of Christ. We, are, we go through water baptism to show that we are Christians. And then we live as best we can a holy life for the Lord. That means we study the Bible. That means we pray. That means we go to church. That means we try to live for the Lord. That's being a Christian. I want to ask you, have you really accepted Christ? Or are, like you, or are you like Nicodemus? Are you a religious person? And maybe you've prayed because you want to go to heaven, but you're not willing to live for Christ. Maybe you've prayed because you wanted your sins forgiven, but you were not willing to live for Christ. You've, made a, you've not made a total surrender to Christ. 
The only way to go to get into heaven is to be born a second time. If you've not had that new birth, would you bow your head and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save your soul? If you do that tonight, I challenge you to accept Christ as your Savior, to live for Him, and to get in a good Bible-believing church where you can be taught and nurtured. Thank you for your time.